so um, to make up for our lost classes, I'm going to quick record a couple of things that we still need to make up on. The first thing we need to get through is neuroscience methods. So um, for neuroscience methods, uh, there are a number of ways in which cognitive neuroscientists gather data. One of them is to examine patient populations in uh, a field we call neuropsychology. And neuropsychologists always study disorder populations, usually people with some sort of disease, um, mental disorder like schizophrenia or depression, or have some sort of brain injury, so they've had a stroke or an aneurysm or some sort of other trauma. We're going to examine a number of these individuals as we move through the semester. In fact, I've already had you look at one of these cases of people who have what we call prosopagnosia, which is an inability to recognize faces. So we're going to take a look at what we can learn about these patients uh, and uh, learn about what those patients can tell us about how the brain works and how it accomplishes a variety of tasks like pattern recognition, like speech, like language, like memory. Uh, so it's a really important part of what we're going to look at this semester. Another thing that neuroscientists can do is they can actually manipulate the brain. Um, and one of the ways that they can do so is through what we call pharmacological lesioning, which is a fancy term for just we can cause uh, the brain to stop working in certain ways through the administration of drugs. In my own particular research, we have actually modeled uh, regular sort of what we call organic amnesia through a drug called midazolam. Uh, its prescription or brand name is Versed. A number of, you, number of you have probably actually been administered this drug in an outpatient surgery setting. Oftentimes it's used by oral surgeons, dentists, that sort of thing. But the drug causes very dense amnesia while not necessarily causing you to be unconscious. So we call this a conscious sedation procedure in which a patient is actually awake but has no memory for the event. And oftentimes this is done to sort of limit the traumatic experience. Uh, things like burn patients are often kept on a pretty steady diet of midazolam so they don't remember the trauma of their treatment. Um, things like uh, an endoscopy where they have to put a tube down your throat. You have to be awake to kind of swallow the tube. Uh, and so, and it's unpleasant. So oftentimes they'll just give you percent for that. In our studies, we actually just uh, use it to try to model memory and look at the conscious versus unconscious components of memory. Uh, another way this can be done is through transcranial magnetic stimulation. And I haven't figured out a way to show these videos yet, Echo 360, so I'm going to post these two TMS videos. And what you're going to see uh, is uh, probably a graduate student being subjected to transcranial magnetic stimulation. And what they're able to do is actually shut off the language production centers of his brain. And so they actually shut off what's called Broca's area in which uh, language production occurs. And so I'll, uh, I'll make sure to post those so you can take a look at those on your own. Uh, the other ways in which uh, the intact brain is stimulated in uh, humans is what we call in vivo electrical stimulation. And usually this is a patient who's already undergoing some sort of neurosurgery. And so they'll remove part of the skull, uh, and then they actually put a net of electrodes right on the surface of the brain, and they can stimulate the brain with electricity and actually activate those parts of the brain. There are two reasons this is done in surgery. One is to map out where the specific parts of the cortex are to try to protect critical areas during surgery. And the other is, of course, uh, just investigative. Uh, similar things are also done uh, in animals. Uh, the other thing that can be done in uh, animals is physical lesioning. They'll open the skull, remove part of the brain, or ablate part of the brain with um, uh, various procedures. In humans, sometimes there are very specific neurosurgeries that are done, like uh, epilepsy surgery, that allow us to look at what removing a specific part of the brain might do. We'll take a very close look at this when we look at a patient HM when we talk about memory. But over at GW, they do a very small uh, removal of part of the temporal lobes. It has to do with um, motor perception or something. But it does provide us with some pretty uh, interesting case studies. Most of the time we're interested in examining uh, healthy you know, college students like yourself and we don't want to cause any damage so we just record what's happening in the brain. The primary way that that's done is by measuring electrical, or one of the primary ways that's done is by measuring electrical activity in the brain. The oldest sort of 
basic version of this is what we call electroencephalography or EEG. An EEG is just a continuous recording of the electrical activity in the brain. What you can see in these pictures are electrodes that are placed uh, near this on the scalp. Um, oftentimes they have to, uh, in this one on the right, uh, this is the system I use to collect the data from my dissertation. You have to move all the hair up from underneath those electrodes. It's total pain. Uh, the system on the left uh, yeah, it's kind of a mess because they put this skull uh, cap on and then they inject some liquid or gel and it makes kind of a mess. Uh, the nice thing about these is they're, they're really accurate and relatively inexpensive. A top of the line EEG system is about $100,000, which sounds like a lot of money, but compared to other uh, kinds of techniques, it's relatively inexpensive. This is the data, kind of data we get from EEG. It provides what we call a state measure. So this is sleep data. You've no doubt seen this in intra psych. Uh, and this is how the brain waves change uh, on an EEG pattern from alert wakefulness, stage one sleep, stage two sleep, stage three sleep, stage four sleep. So EEG provides us with a nice sort of, what sort of state the brain is in at the time. More often though, we're really interested in connecting um, the brain's activity to external events, particularly as cognitive psychologists, we're interested in things like how does pattern recognition work? So how do we recognize words versus letters or words versus non-words? Uh, or interested in things like memory. So oftentimes what that entails us doing is time locking those electrical recordings to external activity. So a word appears on the screen, we trigger the computer to start recording, and we record for, say, the next 2,000 milliseconds or two seconds, and then we can see how neural events unfold in time. So it uses the exact same equipment as EEG, but we call it event-related potentials because we're tying that electrical activity to a specific external event. So again, it's specifically linked to an event, and one of the things we do is signal averaging. The brain's a very busy place, and one of the most difficult things in cognitive neuroscience is trying to come up with ways to measure brain activity and only get the things we're interested in. Because, you know, while you're sitting in an experiment, your heart's beating, you're breathing, you're blinking, you're hungry, you're thinking about the weekend, you might be fidgeting a bit. We want to get rid of all of that. So the assumption is if we average a bunch of these trials over time, so say 100, you, all that will even out. We call it noise. So we get a high signal to noise ratio. Uh, EEG provides, or ERP provides, really great temporal resolution. In fact, we get millisecond by millisecond unfolding of neural events over time. The problem is, is we get really lousy spatial resolution, which means we can't really see where in the brain something is happening. We can see where on the scalp we're getting later. In fact, electrical signals bounce all over. Uh, the skull reflects electrical signals. Um, and so trying to figure out where in 3D space these signals are coming from is pretty difficult. They're getting better at it, and oftentimes they'll combine event-related potentials with functional magnetic resonance Im imaging and get a pretty good combination of the two. So here's an example of some data um, where we're trying to compare um, someone looking at non-words, words, and pseudo-words. So you can see um, these brainwave patterns are pretty similar for words and non-words. A little bit of difference. In fact, you can see words and non-words early on in these brainwaves are very similar. It's later on. So if you look down here, uh, that's where we start to get significant differences. And then uh, non-words are completely different almost from the get-go. So we see these perception of letters and then a complete difference in the way those are perceived. These different um, letters, the F7, F3, F4, F8, simply have to do with where on the scalp that electrode occurs. These are frontal lobes, central and temporal, relatively straightforward. Uh, the Cs uh, are generally right down the uh, center line. This is some data from my dissertation um, where you can see uh, what, what this is looking at is participants either uh, saw words uh, during the study period, or they heard them presented over speakers. And here they're trying to remember words at test. So the people who had studied words that they saw versus heard have completely different brainwave patterns uh, when they're trying to remember a heard event versus a seen event. So pretty neat data.
At least I thought so. So that's event-related potentials. Another way in which we can try to measure electrical activity in the brain is through what's called magnetoencephalography. Uh, as you should know, electricity is associated with magnets. So you can run a current through uh, metal and turn it into a magnet. In fact, that's how magnets are created. So wherever there's an electrical field, there's a, a subsequent magnetic field. And so magnetoencephalography uh, tracks electrical activity in the brain by tracking those magnetic fluctuations caused by neural firing. Uh, this has really terrific temporal resolution and spatial resolution. The problem is, is there's not much of this research done because it's incredibly, incredibly expensive. This is, you know, a hundred million dollar piece of equipment. Uh, it has to be installed in its own space to shield it from the Earth's magnetic field. So the electrical activity or the magnetic fluctuations that they're trying to measure are several orders of magnitude lower than just the background magnetic radiation of the Earth. Um, and so these uh, things shown here are called squids, which are super, super conducting quantum interference devices uh, that have to be super cooled. Uh, so it's a really, really expensive procedure. So it's not done all that much. Oftentimes, we're more interested in just looking at someone's brain structures. And in fact, this is a really critical part of the neuropsychology the stuff we're going to talk about, because we really want to know where an injury has occurred. The oldest and simplest version of this is called a CT scan or a CAT scan, which is computer to axial tomography. It simply uses x-rays uh, to construct a 3D structural image. So we get a series of x-rays, provides a nice 3D picture, and you get you know, some decent resolution. You can certainly see a tumor, uh, or if there's a bullet, or you know, a sword or something stuck in somebody's head. Uh, you can see all of that, or you can see sort of gross uh, anatomical differences, as you can see here in this encephali encephalitis patient. Um, but they don't provide the best images. If we want a really good structural image, we use magnetic resonance imaging. And magnetic resonance imaging is terrific for imaging soft tissue. Um, and so by, the reason for that is it's essentially measuring the water, or it's able to look at where there's water. And so soft tissue is made up a lot of water. So that's why MRIs are good for knee injuries, shoulder injuries, uh, that sort of thing. And it's particularly good for imaging the brain and its subcortical structures. Um, so we have a strong magnetic field that then alters the magnetic properties of water, provides us an ability to see soft tissue. So here you can see um, this is a one Tesla magnet, a two Tesla magnet, and I believe this is a three and a half Tesla magnet, which are just simply measures of field strength. So a T1, one T magnet, or two T most, MRI units you'll come across or I've ever been exposed to are one and a half Tesla magnets. Three, four and a half T magnets are usually research only. There is one in Chicago that's a seven Tesla magnet. I'm not sticking my head in that. Um, that's a pretty strong magnetic field. So those are structural images, all very important for uh, looking at the brain. Lots of new uh, studies looking at things like the effect of socioeconomic status on brain structure differences uh, really provides us with some important differences. In fact, there's a lot of work done in examining brain structure differences in patients or different populations, drug users, all that kind of thing. So we're going to take a look at some of that this semester. Uh, oftentimes we're really interested in looking at what we call functional neuroimaging, which is trying to see the brain in action while it's functioning. Uh, the oldest of these is what we call positron emission tomography. A uh, related version is called SPEC for single photon emitted computed tomography. SPEC. Um, the way this works is you inject the participant with a radioactive tracer uh, to track the use of blood, glucose, and different neurotransmitters depending on the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter itself will either bind, or sorry, the radioisotope will bind to uh, something in the blood or will bind to a specific receptor on neural cells. So for example, you can inject a radioisotope that binds only to serotonin neurons or binds only to dopamine neurons. It allows you to sort of see where the brain's using those substances. It allows you to um, tack onto glucose or uh, oxygenated hemoglobin to see where those things are being used in the brain. The brain uses a lot of sugar, and so that's a really good way to measure brain activity. Uh, PET scans provide pretty good spatial resolution on the order of a couple of centimeters, which actually in the brain is, is a long ways. 
um, but very, very bad temporal resolution. It takes uh, 15, 20 minutes to scan the entire brain uh, for one trial. And so if you're going to do a functional study, you have to have a participant doing the same thing for that entire period of time. And that really alters the kind of tasks you can do. <laughs> you have to scan over a period of minutes, and you have to get somebody to sit still for that long, which is difficult. Uh, and so it requires these kind of block research designs where, uh, for example, if you're interested in studying recognition memory, in a typical recognition memory study, present a participant with a list of words, and then later you give them a list of um, new words and previously studied words, and the task is to figure out which are the new words and which are the previously studied words. Well, in a PET study, you would have to put all of the new words together and all of the old words together, which really dramatically alters the task. So it's a pretty different kind of thing to do. Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging is far uh, more commonly used. PET scans are more used uh, in uh, other diagnostic areas. fMRI is the go-to uh, kind of um, procedure in cognitive neuroscience. And this image is what we call the hemodynamic response. Uh, which means this is where the brain is using um, blood. So the way this works is oxygenated hemoglobin, which has oxygen in it, and deoxyhemoglobin, which has had its oxygen removed by cells, um, operate differently in the presence of a strong magnetic field, and they effectively they wobble oh, or spin in sort of different ways. Um, and as a result, you can image where there's oxyhemoglobin and where there's deoxyhemoglobin. And the assumption is where there is this change in signal, that is deoxyhemoglobin, is where the brain is busy doing something because it's used up that oxygen. So that's the basic idea here. So it's imaging that hemodynamic response. Um, the problem with fMRI is there aren't a lot of good statistical tools available for analyzing the data. In fact, oftentimes you just kind of have to look at it and say, well, it seems to be different. So here you can see um, what they're showing here is some sort of change in signal in an experiment. And so what you have to do, again, much like with event-related potentials, is you have to use what's called a subtractive method. Um, because you have to say, well, here's what the brain's doing uh, when it's doing our task. So if we're talking about something like face recognition, we have to have a task where they're looking at faces, but then we have to have another task that involves all the rest of the brain except faces. So we have to involve the visual system that's maybe complicated, that involves pattern recognition. It's a tough thing to do. Um, an easier example would be we're interested in how, where the brain processes words, so all we use are a string of letters that are not words. That simple. So then we've taken up the visual cortex that recognizes letters, and what we're left with is words. Um, so then you get these nice maps that show you sort of here's where things were happening you know, for words versus non-words or whatever. Uh, these are all then projected onto um, an idealized brain. What they've done is they've scanned a couple thousand brains and sort of come up with the, what the average brain looks like. Um, the thing with fMRI is it's not terribly expensive, about three, three hundred dollars an hour maybe, uh, compared to PET scans, which is about thirty-five hundred dollars a participant. So these are the ways in which cognitive neuroscientists study the brain uh, and are able to make inferences about where the brain is accomplishing what. All right. Well, so that is your quick introduction to.